Welcome to the Foul Play YouTube channel. <laughs> Why, well, thank you there. Thank you very much. I don't recall. It's great to be here. And uh, hold on, let me let me let me shut that down. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. And today, of course, is a very special day. And uh, hold on, someone someone's calling me. Hold, hold on a sec, guys. Hold on a sec. Oh, oh my God! You're not gonna believe this, guys. Look, look who I've got. <laughs> Oh, 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 my God. oh, I just can't, I just can't believe this. And now, now, Santa, you, you agree in the total innocence of Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey? Oh, unbelievable. unbelievable. Thank you so much, Santa, for your support. Thank you. Looks like you've been a good boy. I'm always a good boy. Good Catholic <laughs> but, um, boy. Correct. Just, correct. And just, Doc, I'm just thinking about that scene in um, Die Hard where um, I can't think oh, of yes. his name, the bad guy. He goes, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> correct. <laughs> correct. Correct. Well, look, guys, um, uh, all jokes aside, a Merry Christmas for all of you guys uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, I think. Um, if today is uh, December the 25th, uh, a Merry Christmas to you all, guys. And again, thank you so much for showing up. And for most people in America, it's, of course, November, December the 24th. So it's uh, Christmas uh, Eve and um, a, a Merry Christmas Eve to everybody. And again, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you know. Hey, Doc, look who's joined us. Look, look who's joined us. Uh, who's oh Zoe has oh no oh no oh. hold on hold on hold on hold on hold on danger Christmas Zoe Merry Christmas, Zoe. Merry Santa. Christmas everyone and, and look at this Santa oh Ian says welcome welcome Zoe great to see Thank you. you unbelievable Thank you. Zoe were, were, wow. were, were you a good girl or a bad girl I mean it's already Christmas where you live so you know depending on if, if you got like a lump of coal that means you're like a really bad i'm just asking i i don't know yet i will know tomorrow uh, oh. <laughs> i haven't gotten any presents yet santa okay hasn't uh, yet. oh okay i thought, thought santa had already showed up okay all right he's still uh, in australia it. you just saw yeah <laughs> all right correct he's here and i can prove it he's right here <laughs> well look guys <laughs> Thank you so much. It's great to be here. And uh, look, even though it is Christmas, um, I still think it's important that we continue our good work and spread the message and, uh, you know, give people hope um, who are involved in this case, uh, Stevens, Brendan's and other wrongful conviction cases. Even though it is Christmas, you know, we still want to spread the good word and the message. And um it's great to have everyone here in in on the panel uh, and in chat. Thank you so much. And for those of you who've been following what we've been doing, uh, we've been reading. Uh, Neverly and I have done a project together entitled uh, "Reading with the Crew." And so, what we have been doing is reading selective chapters uh, from John Farrakh's book, "The Wrecking Crew." Uh, and at the moment, if you're following our podcast series. Um, we're on chapter five, and the chapter is entitled Skinny, which is a very, very interesting chapter indeed. And today we're doing part two, and fingers crossed we're going to finish it because my family, we're doing a barbecue for lunch, and I don't want to miss the barbecue. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to be in big, big trouble. And uh, so we're going to try our very, very best to finish off the chapter uh, today in today's uh, podcast. Uh, and it's been a very, very interesting chapter, like I said. Uh, and what is very important here, guys, is that we are reading specific passages from John Farrakh's book. And these are his words, his thoughts. They don't necessarily represent uh, our thoughts, our opinions. But we all agree that John Farrakh's book is an excellent book. Definitely worth reading. And remember, at the end of the day... It's important that you do your own research 
come up to your own conclusions. Not everyone on the foul play team agrees with each other on things. Uh, we like to debate, discuss, but we do it in an amicable way. Right, guys? We've got our own ideas, our own thoughts, and, uh, you know, we can still present a unified approach and a unified message. And again, guys, thank you so much. Uh, all of us on the Foul Play team want to thank every one of you guys uh, who are in chat, who come and uh, come to our podcast on a weekly basis. Uh, as you know, we do uh, lots of different podcasts. We've got um, Jack61, who does the open mics, and at the moment is doing the Colburn versus Netflix. Uh, and that's been a real excellent series. We've got Sunshine Christina as well, who does her crime theory exchange. So what we try and do is if we get documents and new information, we try and present it to you guys as best as possible. So all of us on the Foul Play team want to thank all of our subscribers. Uh, we've grown really well uh, and constantly throughout the year. And again, thank you so much, guys. If you enjoy what we do, please give us a thumbs up. And we appreciate all your feedback. Um, I certainly, uh, most of the panel members check the uh, discussion and your comments. We try and answer your questions, hopefully during the live. If not, after the live, we go through the chat and try and answer your questions. Again, thank you so much. Uh, all of us on the Foul Play team want to thank all our super mods, our mods, and all the people that work in the background, like Zoe, and uh, it's so great to see Zoe here today, uh, and your Riz, uh, and other members as well who work so hard to get these podcasts uh, up and going. Again, thank you so much. And don't forget, we also have a merch store that Susan, Zoe has put together. Again, thank you so much for your support. Money goes directly to a specific charity. And all the money that we make on Foul Play, we use it to buy documents, to put them in our library, to share. They're for free. And we have a very extensive online library as well. So check out our website and our Discord channel. There's always somebody there. At the moment, things are quiet, right? We're all waiting uh, for Zelna to put in a, a, a new response. We're waiting for the state. So things are, are a little bit at a lull at the moment, but I'm sure things will heat up pretty quickly. Well, look, guys, um, not to uh, waste any more time so we can start the podcast. Let's go quickly around the panel. Just a quick hello and how things are coming along. First, we have Neverly. Neverly, how are things coming yeah. along? Things are coming along really uh, well. It's... Um... You know, the pre-holiday atmosphere at work, people are there, but they're not. Everybody wants to be off work. So yeah. finally, we're off work. We have a long weekend. We're off on Monday, and I'm really happy. And thank you, everybody in chat and on the panel, of course, for um, meeting us here today. Not that we're addicted or anything, you know, on a Christmas Eve. No. But no, no, this is really cool. We can get away for an hour or so. It's we okay. Can. We're cool like that. Yeah. Yeah. We can. Awesome. Thank you very much, Neverly. Much appreciated. And next we have, I don't recall. How are you coming along? Coming along pretty well. We're having a bit of bad weather here, but tomorrow's looking better. So happy about that and happy to be here. Welcome, everybody. Awesome. Thank you very much. I don't recall. Great to see you here. And next we have Sugar. How's it coming along? <laughs> hey, Doc. Merry Christmas, everybody. My keyboard is not working today, so unfortunately I can't chat, but I want to tell you all Merry Christmas. Happy to be here. Um, I will admit that I am addicted. I'm sorry, but um, there's just no getting around it. So here we are, yeah. Christmas Eve. Woohoo! <laughs> Correct, correct, correct. And uh, next we have um, oh, is it Mama Doc, Santa? can I say what can I say yeah. one more thing? Of course you can, um, Susan. If if y'all haven't seen the new T-shirt with Alice on it, um, check it out in the in the um, merch store. It's it's pretty awesome. I got one myself. <laughs> oh, awesome! We should put it on a huge banner. Yeah, the T-shirt. <laughs> correct, correct. 
Correct. And uh, lo, lo and behold, now, now wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. <laughs> I can't believe it. It's my, it's Mama Alice Claus. <laughs> How's it going, Alice? <laughs> How's it going, Alice? <laughs> oh, you're muted, Tweety. Muted. Oh, no. No, oh, no. She's having there a bit of trouble. Ah, there, we go. there we go. Hello, How's everyone. How's it going, Alice? Hello, going, Alice? Yeah, good, thank you. I just thought it would be Christmassy. And you've got your Santa dog, and I've got my dancing Santa. Oh, isn't that, isn't that lovely? Oh, my God. This is going to be a fun episode, I could tell. <laughs> thank you very much, Alice. Thank you very much, Alice. Uh, and uh, you're not going to use any cuss words in your Santa hat, right? You're not going <laughs> to. <laughs> yeah, you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much, Alice. Uh, and next we have a Jack61. Jack61, how are things? Oh, uh, colder than a well digger's ass. <laughs> it's, and it's colder, cool. where she, it, yeah, it's colder where she is. I'm doing good. I want to thank everyone for coming and supporting us on Christmas Eve here in the States. It's Christmas Day for you, Doc, and almost Christmas yes. for Zoe and, and Alice and a lot of our European friends. So really kind of a special day it's been a really interesting chapter i really enjoyed it skinny from the book and uh yeah just want to say merry christmas to everyone out there and the live chat to you you and yours from the jack family and the file play family awesome fantastic thank you so much jack 61 and it's my pleasure to introduce zoe Zoe, how are things coming along? Drum roll. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it's it's fine. I, I I'm I'm sick again. I just. Uh, oh, I think I think you know when you go back to school after two years with oh. masks and everything, and then you catch all the viruses everything. there are. Um, so I've been sick. I the last time I've been sick, it was like I don't know two weeks ago and now i'm sick yeah. again but the good something thing is, is going around zoe yeah yeah it's always something going around mm -hmm. and it always finds me this year i'm now 10 days off yeah hey. yeah awesome hey awesome. Uh, I, think, I, over I, here. I think we should have a slumber party at zoe's house i don't know yeah i'm uh, i'm already i'll bring pizza pajama, so let's go yeah, come on, let's go. Wait. We can do a carpet fix next. Frozen. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so isn't much. Sorry. Isn't everything frozen in the States? <laughs> Just about. That is here. Yeah. Awesome. Shut up. Never what? Really. Yep. <laughs> we're not going to talk to Neverly. Um, yeah. All right, guys. Well, look. I like to welcome everyone in chat. Thank you again, guys, so much for joining us. It's been fantastic. And at the moment, we have uh, Maz. Uh, welcome, Maz. We've got Dark Side of the Moon. We've got uh, JD. We've got Sher. Welcome. Good to see you here. Uh, who else have we got? We got Andy B. We got Andy B. <laughs> Good to see you. Don't Andy go. B. <laughs> Don't go. We've got Master Cedar. Uh, good to see you here. Uh, who else we got? Um, oh, we've got Disco Pervert. Welcome. Good to see you here. Uh, we've got uh, Kay Parnell Sanders. Great to see you here. Uh, we've got Graham Moss. Good to see you here. Uh, now we've got Catnit. Welcome, Catnit. Uh, Supermod. We've got, yes, we've got Gloria. Good to see you here, Gloria. Uh, we've got Ronald uh, Cass. Hi, uh, Ronald. Good to see you here. Yeah. Hi, Ronald. Uh, we've got uh, another Gloria. Uh, let's hope I haven't missed it. We've got Jazznaz Gaming. Uh, welcome, Jazznaz. Uh, we've got Anthony Hills. And I think, I think I've caught everybody out. And, uh, and so Dark welcome. Side, Superman Dark, uh, Dark Side. Side. Yes, Dark Side. She's here. 
Uh, welcome everyone. It's great to see everyone on the panel. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, Jack61, did you have something you wanted to play first of a Christmas nature? Do you have that? Or do we uh, play that a bit later? Well, that's really up to um, that's really up to sugar. I, I'm good doing it now. If you guys are ready, give me Let's just one. Go for it. All right, give me just Susan, go for it. Give me, yeah. give me, all right, give me just one second here. I'm gonna flip screen. Okay, so you might have to unmute if uh, you're on the panel. Yeah, you'll if you're on, if you're on the Discord, you're definitely gonna have to unmute to hear. Correct. All righty. Let me flip over. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Here we go. Fixing to play it. On the first day of planting, the guilty hit a rev to screw Mr. Stephen A. On the second day of hygiene, Scott showed the way to Pam, the bluish green wrap, all to screw Mr. Stephen A. Free. On the third day of sleuthing, the seventh entry found one lonely key of bluish green wrap, all to screw Mr. Stephen. On the fourth day of planting, old Josie's pots of bone. One ah bone of only key of bluish green wrap, all to screw Mr. Stephen A. Free. On the fifth day of bullshit, the press they sealed his fate. Stephen's guilty. One aha bone, one lonely key of bluish green wrap, all to screw Mr. Stephen A. Free. On the sixth day of antics, Paul Hain has found some blood, six drops of blood, Stephen's guilty. One aha bone, one lonely key of blue. Green wrap, all to screw Mr. Stephen A. Free. On the seventh day of November, Gus Road was all the rage. Nothing here to see, six drops of blood. Stephen's guilty. One aha bone, one lonely key of bluish green wrap. All to screw Mr. Stephen A. Free. And now we get to Brendan, poor boy is so naive. Their truth will set him free, nothing here to see. Six drops of blood, Stephen's guilty. One a hop on one. All to screw Mr. Stephen A. Free. After nine hours of sweating, Ken Kratz was on TV. A sick fantasy, the truth will set him free. Nothing here to see, six drops of blood. Stephen's guilty. One a hot bone, one lonely key of bluish green calf. All to screw Mr. Stephen A. Free. The press has a field day, they're guilty, don't you see? One small prize, a sick fantasy, the truth will set him free. Nothing here to see, six drops of blood, Stephen's guilty. One aha bone, one lonely key of bluish green wrap, all 
thought to screw Mr. Stephen A. Free. Now they're back to searching. Oh God, what do they find? One magic bullet, one smug prize, a sick fantasy. The truth will set him free. Nothing near to see. Six drops of blood. Stephen's guilty. One aha bone, one lonely key of bluish green graph. All too true. Mr. Stephen A. Free. Can Cat's favorite evidence the last piece that he needs? One good latch swab, one magic bullet, one small prize, a sick fantasy. The truth will set him free. Nothing here to see. Six drops of blood. Stephen's guilty. On the twelfth day of my song, in walks Miss Kathleen Z. Exoneration, ball sack, could swap one planted bullet, stolen day glamour. Poppy Dassey, the truth will set him free. So much more to see, the real DCD. Stevens, not guilty. No bones are left to test the plan. They won't give up the wrath. Stephen Penn didn't walk free. Well, that was just fantastic. Way to go. Well, I'll tell you what. I reckon we should just shut the podcast down right now. We're not going to be able to top that. <laughs> that was incredible. Uh, in incredible. Uh, thank you very much, Susan. And that was sung by uh, Myed, if I remember yeah. that correctly. Yes. Yeah. And, and yeah. the thing about that song, I actually wrote it the night that I joined Foul Play. I had most, wow. I had most of it written. And then I joined and I got on the Mammaholics and there were a bunch of people in there. And B I remember BB was there and uh, quite a few people. And I told them what I had so far and they said, keep going, keep going. So I finished it the rest that night and then BB got mired to sing it. So, yeah. And that was yep. uh, Great job. three years ago. Yeah. That's incredible. Fantastic. Absolutely awesome. incredible. And I'll Thank tell you, you someone else who's, I tell you, someone else is extremely talented on voice and guitar. It's none other than our own Zoe. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Incredibly talented. Who's that? Never heard of her. I didn't her. know she played Never guitar, heard. but I've heard her beautiful voice. Absolutely. It's like an angel. Yes. Yes. Can we move on, guys? <laughs> no, we're, we're gonna we're gonna talk about you for a while now that we we brought we brought Doc brought it up. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Yeah, we're gonna be we're... on a panel again. That's oh. it. That's it. Well, we're we agreed. Guys. I mean, we agreed. I mean, uh, you know, Doc and I, and, you know, we all had a you know meeting without you, and uh, you know, we agreed that you know it, it's fantastic that you're on the panel, but you can't have the the button. You're you're barred from the button, the red yeah, button. I'm I'm so I'm so happy. Button. I'm so no, I'd also like that. I'd also like to say if you'd like to hear her uh, as always beautiful voice, she does an intro on the Ricky Hochstetler video, which is on Foul Play. So look that up and check it out. It's amazing. She can, she can really sing, guys. She really can. Oh, yeah. So take oh, yeah. this say, say thanks, Zoe. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean the 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 reality is, is that. Um, we're really fortunate here as a team. Yeah. There are some fantastic people with incredible talent and everyone works for free, gives up their time and, you know, for the cause and causes, we all have different cases that we're interested in. We're all interested in the Brendan Dassey, Stephen Avery case, of course, but there are many other wrongful conviction cases uh, and we think of, we think of them and their families especially those who are in prison. And what is really 
uh, interesting if I could just have a quick word is that um, I think it was yesterday or the day before I listened to a podcast featuring Mark Hodenot uh, and Paul Capaldi. Uh, and if you haven't heard it, I really recommend that you do. It was a really uh, sobering podcast. It was just a simple chat with Mark, Mark Hodenot, who's a fellow and who is a fellow Australian. And uh, Mark, uh, uh, I'm not sure whether he's back or he's still in Wisconsin, but he had visited, he visits Stephen and talks to Stephen. He, he's back up. Uh, and, okay. And uh, Mark uh, said that Stephen is well aware of all these supporters like us. Uh, oh, and bless he thanks, him. Yeah, and he thanks all his supporters. And um, it was incredible because I found that the interview was very sobering and not only not only that, but it was actually very inspiring. And to think that Stephen Avery, who spent uh, more than half of his life in a prison cell, is still very positive and he still thanks all his supporters. And I'm thinking to myself, hey, if Stephen can do that, if Stephen can give a message of hope to us, his supporters, and he's still... Uh, very hopeful, uh, you know, of being exonerated again, then, you know, that's why I'm here. And that's why I'm sure the whole panel is here and people in chat. When you hear those words from Mark and you see that interview, you realise why you're here. Because you are not just looking at making a murderer per se. These are real people with real feelings and real emotions. And Stephen, like I said, has spent more than half of his life in a prison cell, right? That brings very much a reality to things. It really, really does. And it put me in the right headspace. It really, really did. So if if you get the chance, check out. It's not a very long interview. It was with Mark and uh, also with uh, Paul Capaldi. And uh, thank you so much. It was really, really good. Um, guys, does anyone have any quick comments before we start the podcast? Just to okay, add... Six, 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 yeah, just to add to that just a little bit, you know, um, thinking about this case and, and what they did to Brendan and everything that we have, you know, learned over the last, well, it's seven years now. I mean, the reality is, but um, that I've been involved with, you know, a few days after. But everything that's that's come along, to me, it's a, a, a bigger issue of if they can do this to Stephen and Brendan and blatantly, as they have in so many instances that we are well aware of. They can do it to anyone in that state. And that can be, in fact, just to yet another state, right? And it's it, it's Correct. just, you know, for us as an American, uh, we want most of us that are reasonable. Like we want the bad bad guys put away, bad people put away. So we don't yes. want, we don't, this, un, this biased thing that gets, that has been created and infect, it's, it's so infected so many branches of our law enforcement and, and the courts, and we don't want that. <laughs> we just want the right thing done. Reasonably speaking, that's all I wanted to say. Correct. Thank you, Jack61. Yeah, look, there's no doubt the system is broken. The system is badly, badly broken. And uh, let's hope in time that things will get repaired, but it's going to take a long time. <laughs> and uh, there's Alice's cute. That's a husky, I take it. What a cute dog. <laughs> That's Lockie. It's a husky. It's a husky. Yeah, yes, Lockie. Yes, this is Lockie. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, well look, guys, uh, let's try and finish the podcast. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm dead myself because they're going to finish. Cook the you, you mean begin? I think we need to begin. Correct, correct. But uh, Jack sixty one, are you able to put up the very first slide? Yeah, give me uh, now, just what we, give me just one second, yeah. guys, and it'll be. Yeah. So what we've got here, um, remember, we're talking about the Sakiki note, uh, and that was the note that was found in the Green Bay Post Office, and it was very very interesting uh, letter, right? There was no envelope, there was no stamp, uh, and it was folded in three. And the Sakiki note was extremely cryptic, right? But it's when you think about it, it's very alarming.
because it specifically mentions a body being burnt in an aluminum spelter at 3 a.m. on Friday morning, and it was signed Sakiki, right? And uh, what was very interesting was that uh, in last week's comments, because I check all the comments, there was a very interesting comment uh, by um, Avery Wave. Now, I've never dealt with uh, Avery Wave before, um, although I did see Avery Wave in uh, Paul Capaldi's and Mark Hodonot's uh, chat, which is awesome. But Avery Wave made a very interesting comment. And so what I wanted to do is to dis discuss this very quickly, and then we'll, we'll have a look at this. Uh, and what I'll do, um, uh, Susan, would you like to read, can you see, uh, can you see the slide? Yes. Yeah. Are you able sure. to read just just what's underlined? Just what's underlined. So this sure. is from Avery Wave. This is from Avery Wave. Uh, it says, in my opinion, uh, that rumors about the smelter were started by Sandra Morris's brother, Joe Mott, who lived at the corner of Jambo Creek and 147 and was a frequent visitor to Avery Salvage Yard. Wow. Okay. Now, guys in chat and guys on the panel, did you know, yes or no, did you know of a Joe Mott? Alice, did you know of a Joe Mott? Sounds familiar, dog, but I'm not 100% okay. sure. Okay. Interesting. I don't recall. Did you hear about a Joe Mott before? Not, I think, not until last week. And I think, I don't know if somebody mentioned it in the chat somewhere or something, but I saw that okay. name and I looked it up. Okay. Uh, uh, Susan, what about you? Did you know of a Joe Mott before? Well, I have heard his name. Isn't Ma's maiden name Mott? Ma Avery? I think so. Yes, yes. And he must have lived close to Seabird if he lived at Jambo Creek in 147, right? Could well be, yes. I haven't, I haven't checked it up on Google Maps, map, but I'm sure he's very, very close. Uh, Jack61, have you heard of a Joe Mott before? I, I had heard it, and I had seen the DCR report, but, you know, it, I, I didn't take it any further. It didn't uh, stick in my radar, so to speak. Yep, yep. And uh, Neverly, have you heard of a Joe Mott before? I heard of the name. However, I did not connect the dots. Who is he related to until uh, last week when I saw this post on Reddit? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Um, interesting. I, I had not heard of Joe Mott before. I, and I didn't really understand the connection. Uh, Susan, did you have a, a, a quick um, comment? Um. No, uh, I was going to say something. What was it? Uh, oh, I was just going to say that it's a very interesting um, thought that she has. He has every wave. Every wave. Yes, yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. I I don't recall. Do you have a comment? I was just going to say in the rec in the um the online chat here. I had put last week. I think it was um how the Mott's fit in with the Avery's. It's on, it's on Pa Avery's side that she, um, that the Mott's come in. Um, Dora, Dolores was a sharer, I believe, before she got married. Okay, um, thank you. That's sure. all. <laughs> yep. Okay, very, very interesting. Okay, uh, Jack61, can we have the next slide? So that's a very interesting comment. By Avery Wave, and I, and I thank her or him uh, very much for that comment. So if we have a look at the next slide, it um, things really get a bit um, bit interesting here. So yeah, have a look at this. This is in the case I report uh, on page two forty six, and as you can see here, and I'll just quickly read it. Um, yeah, there's n there's no doubt they were. Uh, Deidring and uh, Kevin Heimrall did actually interview uh, Joseph Mott. Uh, and if you have a look down um, where it's underlined, it says, for details concerning this interview, 
please see the report of Special Agent Heimrall. Okay, that's interesting. So I checked our DCI reports and Jack61, can we have a look at the next slide, please? So again, this goes to show, this goes to show that there are gold nuggets still to be found in this case, because I certainly didn't know much about Joe Mott. So here is the actual DCI report. And uh, we've got this in our library, if you're interested. And it says here, and I quote, Tip information, read Joe Mott and David Kruger. And you can see the date. It's dated um, commencing from the 8th of November to the 12th of November. And if you look down um, a little bit lower, uh, these are the subjects. And you can see uh, Joseph Mott. And have a look at his date of birth, the 2nd of the 2nd, 1958, uh, and he's definitely been interviewed. Okay, so they clearly, the investigators clearly wanted to talk uh, to Joe Mott and also to this um, Kruger gentleman. So if we have a look at the next slide, uh, Jack64. So uh, we, we've actually got the DCI report uh, where they actually spoke to uh, Joe Mott uh, and Kruger. Now, um, Alice, uh, are you okay to read this? Can, can you see the uh, note on the screen? Alice is probably, hey, Alice, can you? Just give me a wee sec, Doc. Which one is it? Is it the Calumet Sheriff one? 52? It's S4. Can you see it? S4. It's on yep. the screen. Yep. Are you able so, to read that? Certainly. From November 5th, Thursday, 8th, 8th 2005. <clears throat> Special Agent Kevin L. Hemrell assisted with the investigation of the missing person of Marie, Theresa Marie Hallback, in the town of Gibson, Manitowoc County, Wisconsin. On 11-8-2005, in the late afternoon hours, Special Agent Herm Hemrell remotely checked his office voicemail and retrieved a voicemail message, which was left in the voicemail system on 11 8 2005 at 1.17 p.m. The voicemail message is from a caller who was unidentified and appears to be a female voice. The voicemail message which was left states verbatim, quote, I heard that on Friday, November 4th, 7 a.m., Joe Mott and David Gruger went to Avery Salvage Yard and were told to leave by Steve and Errol because they were going to smell aluminium. They seemed anxious and scared, waiting, and Joe and David had to leave immediately. Thank you. Check it out, unquote. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Today. Yeah. On 11.09... Yeah. On 11.09.2005... At 7.35 a.m., Special Agent Hermel Her and Special Agent Joseph M. Cap Capitani con conducted an interview of David H. Gruger, uh, WM date of birth, 1-14-1964, at his residence of 410 Green Meadow Drive, apartment 25, Reedsville, Wisconsin. Investigators met with Kruger at this apartment and spoke with Kruger in his apartment. No one else was present at the time of the interview. Investigators informed Kruger that he that they were assisting in the investigation of the missing person, Theresa Marie Hallback, and a possible relationship to Avery's Auto Salvage Yard, located at 
South 147 in the town of Gibson, Manitowoc County, Wisconsin. Investigators informed Kruger that they had received information which indicated that Kruger and a friend may have been at Avery's business during the first week of November 2005. David Kruger provided the following information. Kruger stated that he and a friend, Joe Mott, were at Avery's salvage business approximately two weeks earlier. He stated that on a date he could not specifically recall, he and Joe Mott were at Avery salvage, Avery's salvage business attempting to remove a steering wheel from a 1957 Buick Special which was purple and yellow in colour. During the early stages of the interview, Kruger indicated that he is aware that his friend, Joe Mott, goes to every salvage business on a frequent basis. During further questioning, Kruger stated that he and Mott were possibly at Avery's during the previous week. After further questioning, he recalled that he and Mott were possibly at Avery Salvage Yard on Friday 11-4-2005 at approximately 2 or 2.30 p.m. Kruger stated he now recalled that while at Avery's Salvage Business on Friday 11-4-2005, he saw Stephen Avery in the new shop and Stephen was doing something near the waste oil heater. Kruger further stated that he recalled that Chuck Avery was present and Errol Avery also present. He stated Errol was dropping off cars at the business with the rollback or the flatbed tow truck. Kruger stated when he and Mott initially arrived at Avery's salvage business, Mott spoke to Steve and Errol. Kruger stated he and Mott then went down into the salvage yard and went straight south of the red coloured shed, Kruger stated that he ultimately removed a bolt from a vehicle to be used on one of his vehicles. Kruger, Kruger also stated that he and Mott were in the shop area after being in the yard and obtained, you, obtained used antifreeze, which had waste oil mixed with it that they needed to separate. Kruger stated that while at the Avery salvage business, he did not see any fires burning. He stated he that the total amount of time, time he and Mott were at the business was, and then it says miss, missing three pages. Yep, yep. Now, now, there's, now there's, a lot to unpack. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot to unpack here, right, Jack61? Now, what is amazing is that there's no the interview with Mott is not present. Jack sixty one, you got a couple of comments. Oh well, damn. I mean, well, you, you know, you, you how to put this? Um, it's it's interesting. It's an interesting story. But basically, what I'm gathering from it, he didn't see anything. Nothing. Nothing weird going on. No fires. You know, they there they were there to get. You know, a few, a few specific parts, and they did so. Got the antifreeze mixed with oil they needed to separate, and that's all I really get from that particular page there. But I suspect the missing three pages might have something interesting. Correct, correct. But notice the date, November the 4th. Yeah. Right, and that's exactly what the Sakiki note is referring to. Body burnt in a smelter Friday morning. That has to be November the 4th, because that then gels with when the Sakiki note was found. Right, Jack 61? Yeah, and you know, and to bring up again for the millionth time, we don't have a single radio transmission from Manitowoc County. Not one for that day. Correct. And isn't it interesting that on November the 4th, uh, the uh, members of the Avery family were going to melt aluminium? Isn't didn't that Ma remarkable? Didn't, uh, Susan. Mott, didn't Mott say that it was 7 a.m. he was there? Uh, he, he was at the salvage yard at 7 a.m., correct. A and correct. here it says 2 to 2.30 p.m. Yeah, that afternoon. Uh, yeah. Yes, correct, correct. 
Hmm. So I think that mu they must have arrived very early and they were there for most of the day because I think they had to. They went through the uh, salvage yard looking for parts, right? But the amazing thing is, is that in another DCI report, Earl was asked about the aluminium smelter, right? So they must have taken the Sakiki note and what Joe Mott and David Kruger said seriously. Yep. Right? What it they, sounds like. In another, yep. In another DCI report. Yes. Sorry, Susan. I believe Mott said, didn't he say they had to leave right away? At seven a.m. He did. Because they were gonna. Yeah, the the message, the message on the phone. So someone, so someone had phoned uh, up Home Rule and left a voicemail message. A, a female. A female, right? And uh, who do we know was a confidential informant? Kim Ducat. Kim Ducat. Kim, Kim Ducat. And uh, what did Kim Ducat say to check on the Avery Salvage Yard? The, the smelter, the smelter yeah. incinerator, yeah. whatever. And the, the smelters and the incinerators. So isn't that very, very interesting? Oh, first of all, I'd like to welcome Just Rhonda. Just Rhonda. Hey, sis. Merry Christmas. Hi, Rhonda. Homie. Hi, homie. Yeah, sorry I'm late. I, I forgot it was just Christmas Eve today to me today, not Saturday. So I'm so sorry. Done. I have to zero. Thank you for joining us. Of course. Thank you for joining us. So, guys, getting back to this, isn't this very interesting? You've got the uh, melting or smelting of aluminium on November the 4th. You've got a female that rings up a home rule and leaves a message about the fact that the uh, Avery brothers were going to melt aluminium and that uh, both Joe and David had to leave immediately. Then you've got the uh, Sakiki note that mentions the burning of a body in an aluminium smelter, and it has to be on November the 4th. So it seems to me that it's the same individual or individuals that are talking about the same thing. Uh, Susan, do you have a comment? No, I don't. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, Jack61. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry. Forgot to mute up. Okay. And T1 right. said MTSO goes radio silent on November 4th. No no biggie, right? Nothing to see or hear here, folks. Move along. Correct. Correct. Yeah, that Correct. 4th is uh, like a crucial, that's a Friday, right? Crucial, crucial uh, day. Yes, it is a Friday. Yes, mm -hmm. it is a Friday. Correct. Correct. So very, very interesting. And remember, that's the night that uh, Chuck Avery had seen the lights near his property when he was going to Crivets, right? And the mm -hmm. day before, when Stephen and Chuck went to Menards, that's where Stephen Avery saw tail lights near his property. So it seems to be that the third and the fourth is a hotbed of activity. But quite clearly, there is a lot of suspicion regarding that smelter right and then you have the sakiki note uh, magically turn up right so jack 61 can we have the next slide please don't you think that so, also could have been sandra morris the female voice yes good point yes yeah yes yes could could mm -hmm. well be could well be so not only did she call in the tip but she did it twice Right. So uh, I looked up Joe Mott uh, on the Internet and unfortunately, uh, Joe Mott recently passed away. Uh, and it's definitely the same Joe Mott um, because you could see that it's got ex he's got exactly the same uh, birthday as what is written in the report. Uh, and he was a resident uh, of Wisconsin. And what I found very interesting is that he actually worked for Redont and Sons and Sons. Right, he worked at um, disposal and redont sands and gravel. So he clearly was around the same area. And if you have a look further down in the obituary, you can see um, survivors include two sisters, uh, Jolene Dietrich of Brandon, Florida, 
and Sandra Morris of Plymouth. So um, isn't that interesting? Guys, does anyone have any comments? Uh, Susan? Also, the Springs tube. Who lived, that was a Springs tube on the corner of Avery Road and 147. Yes. They're the ones yes. they asked about the, uh, the newspaper delivery. Correct. Correct. Um, Alice, do you have a comment? Yeah, it's actually Cherie. She's put in the uh, the chat. Uh, Willard T and Anna Mott, Willard, Willard Patrick Mott and Gertrude Mott, Sandra Mott Morris, Joseph Mott is the brother of Sandra. So Sandra and Joe were Alan's first cousins. Yes. Yes. And Isn't that incredible? Alan being Stephen's dad. Yes. Correct. Alan Avery. Correct. 100% correct. Uh, and yes, I do believe the deer was found on the 4th. Uh, Jaxie Swan, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's when the deer tag was dated, the 4th of November. That's Bobby correct. Nassie, the road that's, Yep, that's correct. Yep. So we've got this. This now is very, very intriguing. This is not an angle that I knew anything about, right? And if we look at the next slide, Jack61. Do we want to look at her face? He, yeah, we do. So th this, this now has gone full circle when you think about it, and it's actually quite frightening because we all know who Sandra Morris was, right? Sandra Morris uh, was spreading rumours about Stephen and his wife, right? She was going to uh, bars or hotels or clubs or whatever and spreading all these malicious rumours about Stephen and his wife, Laurie. Uh, and unfortunately, Stephen reacted, overreacted rather badly. Uh, and he ran, he ran his cousin, uh, Sandra Morris was um, Stephen's cousin or is Stephen's cousin, uh, ran her off the road. Uh, and stupidly, he pulled a, a rifle on her. Now, according to Stephen, the rifle was not loaded. But that's not the point. The point is he was so desperate that he ran his cousin off the road and pulled out a rifle, right? Uh, and none of us condone that type of action. And what Stephen Avery got, he fully deserved. But he got to a point where he couldn't handle it and take it anymore, right? So, again... Things have gone full circle because Jack 61, if we have a look at the next slide, you can see um, the importance of what happened because Sandra Morris actually became part of Stephen Avery's uh, civil deposition and she gave a deposition uh, during the uh, when they were taking uh, depositions. So Sandra Morris. Uh, appeared on October the 11th, 2005, and she was deposed. Now, the reason why it was so bad for Stephen, for what he did to his cousin, was that Sandra happened to be married to Deputy William Morris, uh, who was part of the MTSO. And of course, Kasurik was his boss. And that may explain um, really the targeting of Stephen by the sheriff, Kasserik, at the time to pin Stephen for the brutal uh, sexual assault on Penny Bernston, right? So it's rather remarkable that all of a sudden you've got Sandra Morris's brother, Joe Mott, at the Avery Salvage Yard on November the 4th, and he had to suddenly leave because the brothers were going to melt aluminium, right? Jack 61, uh, Jack 61, do you have a comment? Just briefly, but, uh, you know, just because I, I, I didn't know the depth of this either. Uh, I mean, I, I've heard these names, you know, uh, Joe Martin. He, he was kind of like uh, so many of these people that they interviewed, kind of like an outlier. You knew the name, but you didn't really know anything else. But now, Correct. But now, probably like you, Doc, I, I see another story that was all in oh. the background that we don't know shit oh. about. Right? Yep. So. Yeah, that's correct. So isn't that remarkable, guys? Sandra Morris's brother 
could potentially be the person who wrote the Sakiki note, right? And if we have if we have a look at the next slide, at Jack sixty one. And just a real quick, Yoga for the Ageless says, uh, law enforcement never fully investigated those claims of lewd behavior, and they never uh, investigated. Steven's wife about having sex on the porch or on the front lawn. Yes. And yes. Sandra Morris fucking hated Steven's guts. You know, oh, didn't she admit that correct. she she saw him? Do you remember when she did the motion of him playing with himself publicly yeah. while she was yeah, driving she, forty miles an hour? But she denied it. She she denied it. She denied it in the court. Uh, in the deposition, right, Jack sixty one. She goes, I never said that. Yeah. That uh, allegedly, no. allegedly, yeah. Stephen was pleasuring himself on the hood of her car <laughs> at forty miles an hour. Absolutely Jack ridiculous. 61. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah she did deny it. It's ridiculous. Something like that. It, well, you can't say uh, Dvorak, something and then deny it. You know, well, that's just yeah. Dvorak, Dvorak didn't like Stephen Avery, but guys. Can you now see? Can you now see the setting up of Stephen Avery by mm. Joe Mott? By Joe Mott, who was the who is the brother of Sandra Morris, who Stephen got into huge trouble back in 1984-85. Because if we have a look, I'll, I'll get everyone to to contribute. Because if you have a look over here, um, Stephen actually was arrested and charged. He was charged with endangering safety regardless of life and felon in possession of a firearm and he was sentenced to six years in prison for this uh susan do you have a comment i just think it, that maybe sandra morris wrote the second key letter also possibly isn't that incredible and what? yoga I mean, said earlier on he goes isn't that interesting that sandra morris comes up again Yes, mm -hmm. in 2005, in 2005, because I'm sure they would have been disgusted that Stephen got exonerated. And don't forget, Sandra, right guys, Sandra Morris was deposed in Stephen Avery's civil suit where she was questioned about, oh, did Stephen do this? Did Stephen do that? So it would have brought back all those ill feelings all over again, and then boom. Later, Stephen gets arrested for the murder of Teresa Hallbach. Uh, just Rhonda. Just a little bit here, uh, which is what I do. Um, can you remind me why at that time Stephen was already a felon in possession of a firearm. Um, uh, I think that was one of the charges. So I think it's a felony to have a, a, a right, well, point a rifle at somebody. Jack 61, is that correct? Yeah, uh, no, it yeah. is. I'm just, that's, I'm, that's true. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a, a felon cannot possess a firearm or be anywhere near or in the same location as a firearm but didn't that didn't he get the felony uh he, he has robberies? He, he, he had he had some other charges prior to that and i, I think one of them was a felony charge if like, i know what you're talking if, about Rhonda. Okay. was it a robbery yes i think yeah. his robberies yeah yeah okay i think those were felons. so he's a felon so he's a felon mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, 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 I think he had I think he had one felon charge from 83 84 but don't quote me on that but I think that's right. Okay, that's cuz I was wait I was thinking wait a minute. <laughs> um, Correct. Why was he already Correct. a felon? Okay, that makes sense. Correct. Okay, thank you. And uh, Clive thank you very much just Rhonda. and Clive made the comment about Judy Dvorak. Uh, yeah, I believe it was her that made the comment that Stephen chained his children uh, to a post uh, with a chain. Um, uh, Judy Dvorak uh, lived across the road from Stephen Avery and Laurie in the same vicinity. Uh, Judy Dvorak didn't like Stephen Avery at all. Uh, and uh, Judy Dvorak, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but she was good friends with Sandra Morris. Yes. Uh, Jack 61. That's right. And, you know, just just to add a little bit more, 
you know, moving forward to the 2005 stuff and, and, and the civil suit, you can just see these people that really didn't like Stephen for whatever reason. They're thinking to themselves, man, we can't let this guy get a hold of millions of dollars. We can't do it. What are we going to do? I can see it right now. Correct. Correct. So, Correct. so maybe it was San, maybe it was Sandra and Joe and Judy that all came up with the sick keynote. Who knows? You know, that could that could well be the case. That could well mm -hmm. be, because remember, with the Sakiki note, that was before they knew that Teresa Horbach had been cremated. That's right. And there, and there were, and there were, and, there, and her remains were found allegedly uh, in Stephen Avery's burn pit in Yanda Burn Barrow Number no. Two, and potentially in the Yan uh, in the Manitowoc County gravel pit. So, isn't that remarkable that? Of the Sakiki note and the phone calls were all about checking the incinerators, checking the smelter, and it just so happened that on November the 4th, the brothers were going to melt aluminium in a smelter. How in the hell did they put all of that together? Because remember, November the 4th, they never found the RAF4 until one day after. So this is incredible. Were the people that hated Stephen in the process of setting him up? That That's remarkable when you think about it. And what blows my mind is that it's the brother of Sandra Morris. Guys, wow, this is just unbelievable. Just I unbelievable. I, I never saw that. And I want to thank Avery Wave just from a comment. And I know that Avery Wave wrote a post in Reddit as well, and basically the same thing. But it's now added a potential important jigsaw puzzle piece that we may now know or narrow down the people that could have written the Sakiki note, that it could have been Joe Mott, Sandra Morris, potentially that they were all involved in somehow penning this together. And remember, the Sakiki note was written in a way that had Manitowoc Sheriff and Avery together. So make no mistake, that was a very important uh, piece of evidence. And guys, what? how did the state treat the Sakiki note? How did they treat it? They didn't. They ignored it. They ignored it, completely ignored it. All right. Um, is it, do we have any comments, guys? All right. So, guys, let's have a look at the next slide. This is the final slide before we actually start the podcast proper because um, there were comments uh, last week um, talking about, okay, they had the Sakiki note, but um, what do they do with the Sakiki note? Did they actually uh, fingerprint it? Did they actually print it? So, um, just Rhonda, can you see the um, S9 slide, the slide? Yes, I can. Are you able to, re so this is basically the receipt of confidential report of laboratory findings. Are you able to read right down the bottom? We don't have to read the whole report, but just down the bottom, where it's been highlighted. This is the Sakiki note. And remember, guys, it was Buting that requested the Sakiki note to be fingerprinted. Not the state, but by Buting. So, Jack61, are you able just to bring it up a little bit to show the highlighted region at the bottom? I'm just going to read it from the slides room, but oh, oh, good. that's fine too. Good. That, that worked too. Good. Yep. Okay. Also included in the reports was a second confidential report of laboratory findings, also dated 12506. It should be noted this would be the letter which was recovered from the Green Bay Post Office. It indicates no latent prints suitable for identification purposes were observed or developed on the aforementioned item. Boom. Investigation finished. Yeah. So from 
from the viewpoint of the state, that was it for the Sakiki note. They now, what is interesting, right, Jack sixty one? What are on those three missing pages from the DCI report where they spoke to Joe Mott? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, we we see this from time to time. I mean, we, certainly we don't have all the DCI reports, but the many, uh, many that uh, uh, yours and Ricky were able to get, you know, we only have, sometimes they don't have a, uh, a header page. Sometimes we have a header page with nothing included. It, it's, it's a mess. Yeah, I'd love to see it. I Correct. mean, the, the rest of that report. Correct. And do we welcome a uh, little drummer girl? Uh, good to see you here. Uh, I think Anthony D has joined us. Our William uh, Gazwal has joined us. Uh, again, thank you very much, guys. But it goes to show that uh, uh, a lot of people watch our podcasts and, uh, and a lot of people comment on our podcasts and that all of us here from the Foul Play team want to thank Avery Way for pointing that out because I was not aware of, of, of this. I was not aware of Joe Mott uh, being the brother of Sandra Morris and the fact that Joe Mott and Kruger were on the Avery Salvage Yard on November the 4th, right? And they were told they had to leave because they were using the uh, aluminum smelter. And then all of a sudden we have someone ringing in, leaving a voicemail message, and then someone writing the Sakiki note, and then um, Kim Jukat. Um, ringing her handler per se talking about check the incinerators uh, on the avery salvage yard so guys i honestly believe we've narrowed down who could have written a sakiki note it's either kinji cat joe mont sandra morris or um who, who's the other one uh susan peter dvorak dvorak right and get you know and get... It, and it, it, it sorry no go susan it would make sense it would make sense that so that they did it anonymously because yes. uh judy and um sandra were both deposed so it yeah, makes sense that it correct. wasn't an anonymous yeah correct very interesting and, and isn't that amazing that I'm sure people like Dvorak and uh, and also uh, Sandra Morris just wanted all that to end. They just wanted it all to end, the depositions. And lo and behold, Stephen Avery gets arrested for the murder of Teresa Horbart, putting an end to the depositions. Guys, you couldn't even make this up. You could not make this up. In 19... Her, we're talking about... Hmm? Never Sandra Morris's hatred for Stephen was palpable. Correct. Correct. Uh, just Rhonda. Um, well, I just wanted to say that um, uh, Sandra Morris and Judy Dvorak make perfect sense to me. Perfect sense as far as uh, who wrote that note. And I had never thought of that before. But it makes perfect sense that it would be them, the two of them, because of you know they are involved in the deposition and the case. And as much as they despised, and you, somebody was saying this early earlier, as much as they despised Stephen and the Averys, but particularly Stephen, I can see it makes perfect sense to me that they would be. Um, they would they would there was just like you said earlier there's no way in hell that they were going to allow Stephen to win all that money or any money whatsoever while they're still you know living you know a, a middle class or whatever uh lifestyle there's no way so i really like the judy dvorak and sandra morris uh, yeah. i think that was put together yeah that that, that. That you you can't make that up. You cannot make this up, guys. Someone that Stephen got placed in prison for in 1984, and he got arrested, um, charged in 1985, could potentially be the same person that wrote or penned the Sakiki note in 2005. Now, and why we say that? 
I'm so sorry, Dr. Silkman. Why do we say that? Because Judy Dvorak was the one who said, oh, that sounds like Avery to Penny Bernstein. Sandra Morris created the story of Stephen's lewd conduct. So, Dvorak did. Dvorak did. Yeah. 100% yeah, and, correct. And, and don't forget what else Dvorak did. She, she created that report, this police report, Yes, uh, that said that uh, Stephen had abducted this little eleven-year-old girl in that van. Oh, no. It was com it was a complete lie. Yep. Yeah. the The thing is, is that they wanted to nail Stephen. They wanted to put him away for a very long period of time. And oh my God, it looks like that they had a hand in the Sakiki note, <laughs> which is remarkable. I uh, just wonder. Sorry, I forgot to meet back. And uh, uh, I think um, Yoga for the Ageless in chat goes, uh, which tells me the killing was not random. I hope that's not the case. I really hope that's not the case because, you know, some of us potentially are thinking that it could have been a hit on Teresa solely for the purpose of stopping that deposition, uh, not only stopping the depositions, by stopping the civil suit. I know that's a bit nefarious of me to say that, but I pray to God that that wasn't a targeted hit because that, that's just shocking if that's indeed the case. Does anyone want to have any comment? Hey, it happens. It's like it's not like it doesn't happen. It does happen, but it's very scary to think that. And as you said, I hope that's not the case. Yeah, so I don't know, uh, someone in chat, it was Anthony Hills talked about uh, Sakiki. Um, I don't know what the significance of Sakiki is, but I bet you the people that wrote it do. And the message that it was trying to send is probably just a, a code, uh, an insider code. Do you know what I mean? Because the letter was anonymous. No one signed it, Judy or Sandra or Joe. No, no, it was anonymous. So I'm wondering whether Sakiki um, actually had some type of code, you know? So I don't know. I don't know if anyone on the panel knows what Sakiki actually means. Anybody? I don't think uh, anybody. Jackson. Yeah, I don't think anybody really does, Doc. It's been debated from, well, seven years, you know, when we really found out about it. There's been so many people have tried to decipher what it means. Correct. And I don't know. Um, I don't know. I really don't. Correct. But don't you think, guys, that this is a remarkable getting together of the research community that she obviously or he obviously saw our podcast, the Reading with the Crew podcast. We're talking about the Sakiki note and every wave goes, well, I think it could be this. <laughs> and um, we go away and research a little bit and put it all together and thinking, oh, my God. <laughs> That, you, that cannot be a coincidence. That cannot be a coincidence. That's unbelievable. We, uh, we, well, Avery Wave may have uncovered who wrote the Sakiki note. We've narrowed it potentially right down. It can't be random, right? Because it no. mentions yeah. November the 4th. It has to be Friday morn is November the 4th. There's no doubt about that. Aluminum smelter body burnt right it, it's pointing to the avery salvage yard this is before it's discovered that Teresa horbach herself was unfortunately cremated it, guys how, yeah. do, how do you get how the hell do you get that you, Jack 61. You, well you can't get past it and and you know you you made a comment about you know this uh what every wave had contributed and this is the, a perfect example of how I mean, personally, I feel that the community should work together. It's perfect. Yes. It, uh, it's uh, absolutely right. I mean, this, this they saw, 100%. you know, what we were talking about. They said, hey, look at this. We want, you know, we go back and dig a little bit here, dig a little bit there. And it's like, whoa. And it's a perfect example of what we really love to see. I do. It, it, that's the power of the research community. Right. No one, not all of us have the answers or the answers. And you've got a weird report here and then you've got events that took place in 1985 
and all of a sudden they they meld together and you think to yourself oh my god it's gone full circle right you could damn bet you that people like sandra morris probably joe mott rest in peace and dvorak would have been disgusted absolutely disgusted in the mere thought that Stephen Avery was going to become a multi-millionaire. That couldn't have happened. And imagine Kasserik, Vogel, the mere thought that they were going to be deposed next to face the music. And those attorneys, right Jack 61, right Susan, they were brilliant. Kelly, that, Glenn, they were right on the money. And you could tell Right? Look at, remember Rora? I don't recall. I don't recall. I don't recall. I don't remember. He said that. How many times, Jack 61? 137 times. There you go. So now you know that those attorneys for the civil trial for Stephen, they had accumulated a massive amount of information. They were going to dump it all on Kasserik and Vogel's lap. Right, Peg Lock and Slater was not going to be able to save both of them. So you needed something desperate to stop everything. And the only thing you could do to stop the depositions was literally to arrest Stephen for murder. And that's why it doesn't make any sense. But it now makes perfect sense, guys, why Ken Kratz in the trial said, remember, guys, Whatever happened to Stephen in 1985 and his exoneration has got nothing to do with this case. He's so they full of shit. To shut the door. Jack 61. He's so full of shit. He knew that it was tied together. He had to know. And to add to what you're talking about, I said that the last time we brought this up, that warrant for Gregory Allen's DNA had to absolutely scare the shit out of, of the state of Wisconsin. They did not Correct. want that out to anyone. Correct. So, guys, you can see corruption working right here, right? You start, think think about it. You've got the Sakiki note, you've got Judy Dvorak, and you've got a female person ringing up and leaving a message on Home Rule. They're all pointing to the Avery Salvage Yard, and they're all talking about smelters, right? Which is incredible. Because, guys, don't you understand? What they're pointing to is the method of disposal of a body, right? Right, Jack 61. No one said go to the forest or check in the river or check in the Manitowoc gravel pits. Exactly. They talked about specifically on how to get rid of a body with a smelter. Jack 61. <laughs> well, um, you know, thinking about this a, a little bit uh, more mechanically, I, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, this female caller calls in. Um, why did Hamrell get the message instead of Fassbender? That's a rhetorical. I know we can't answer it. I'm just thinking out loud in my brain. Why did that call go to him? And I, I we'll probably never know, but to, no, to, no, well, to, me, but to, to me, it would have went to Fassbender, right? They should have, it, but unless Judy Dvorak gave the person the number to call. Thank you. <laughs> right? Thank you. That's right. Thank you. Right? So if Judy Dvorak says to whoever called, uh, call this number, it'll get actioned. Because it did. We just showed it. They went to speak to Joe Mott and Kruger. So they actioned it. They also went to the Avery Salvage Yard and checked the smelter and the, and the wood furnace. And they said, guys, these haven't been used. Now, guys, don't you think this is brilliant? This is, br this is a form of exoneration for Stephen. Yep. Right? Everyone's hinting how they got rid of the body by the smelter. They and and we know that 60% of her body is missing. The whole trunk is missing. That's correct. That there's a lot of her skeletal remains that have never been found. But this exonerates Stephen because they went and checked the smelters. Guys, nothing to see here. They haven't been turned on, right? Because they checked. Remember we showed the pictures? 
They checked the bottom of the smelter. It hadn't been switched on. And there were aluminium cans in there, right, guys, that hadn't even been melted down. So therefore, you knew that they didn't do a smelter run, right? Otherwise, you would have seen ingots of the melted aluminium. There was nothing. So why are people pointing, one, why are people pointing to the smelters on the salvage yard they check it out and they said, no, nothing to see here. But there's one problem. Who do we know works at an aluminum smelter? Pick me. <laughs> Neverly. <laughs> Neverly. I was just oh going to say God. that. Yep. Yes. Oh, That's my God. That's the aluminum smelter that we know of. Yep. So here's the question. Were they referring to the Avery Salvage Yard? I know Kim Jukat was. Or were they referring to the aluminum smelter uh, where Scott Tadich worked? Does anyone want to make a quick comment? I don't know. Yeah, I, I just don't think we can honestly answer that with 100% accuracy. We have to speculate. And, uh, and I'm like you, Doc. I don't like doing it. We have to theorize. Correct. I don't like doing that either because, you know, you, you don't want to accuse someone of doing something. They love to like, you know, screw you. I didn't do that because it's unfair to them, you know. So Correct. Correct. But, guys, would you admit that now you have to check out Scott Tadich? You do. You, you have to clear you, it. Oh, yeah. You get the Sakiki note. You go, oh, my God, because not notice – what time did they put on the Sakiki note? Uh, it was like, was th hurt. like 3, 3 a.m. or something. I can't remember. 3 a.m. Yeah. It wasn't during daylight hours. Right. It was during the morning. <laughs> Who works at an aluminum foundry in the morning? <laughs> oh, it was Scott. Scott Tadich. Alice, right. do you have a comment? Alice, uh, do you have a yeah, comment? Yeah, just. Yeah, just to what um, Jack was saying about um, the speculation and things like, like that. I mean, none of us like to speculate on things, but there is too many things in these cases. I mean, it's exactly the same with, with, with Luke's case. Um, the yes. way the evidence is pointing and the way the pieces are falling is hard not to, because if the investigations were done properly from the very fucking beginning, Correct. then we wouldn't be here talking about it. You know what I mean? So we can, we, we, we do have to speculate about, you know, alibis and, and, and things like that. And I mean, when it comes to Luke's case as well, I don't like pointing the finger at anybody else, but who else is there? Because Luke never done it, and we know Stephen and Brendan never done it, so somebody else has done it, you know? So, yeah, we don't like to speculate, but sometimes you have to because that's the way the PCs fall. Yes, we're connecting the dots, trying to connect the dots. Right. Yeah. But guys, know, we're just but discussing it. But you have to admit, this is this is remarkable. This is remarkable that you've got all three different events all pointing to smelters, incinerators, body burning, and now the connection between Sandra Morris and Joe Mott, that's mind-blowing. It's gone full circle. It's gone complete full circle, right? And who are the main players back in 85 that you find now in 2005? <laughs> you've got Kaseric, you've got Vogel, you've got Couché, you've got all the old guard, you've got Bushman. They're all coming back. It, you, you can't make this up. Um, just Rhonda, did you have a comment? Yeah, I was just going to say, excuse me. Years ago, when I was kind of more or less, not like researching all by myself, but reading and 
listening to other YouTubes and things like that, um, Richard or Eric Jose and different yes. conversations. Um, I remember I didn't know about the salvage yard smelter uh, for quite a while. And I assumed, I thought that they were talking about the smelter where Scott worked um, all along. So um, when I found out about this smelter in the in the salvage yard, I just thought, well, wait a minute, that wasn't jiving with what, you know, what I remember reading and hearing, you know, prior. So to yes. me, that was always the case, that it was the smelter at the, um, where Scott the foundry. Worked. Yeah, the foundry. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Uh, just to answer a question, um, there was no entire bones found, including rib bones. But according to Dr. Eisenberg, they found rib fragments. Rib fragments. So an entire rib was never found, only fragments. Now, you've got a lot of ribs in your rib cage. Where are, where are, where have they all gone? Where have they all gone? I don't know. You've got the vertebra, the vertebral column. Where's all the vertebra gone? I don't know. So a lot of her skeletal remains, as Neverly pointed out, are gone. Uh, Alice, do you have a comment? Yes, dog. Uh, we've had a few other people join us in chat. Uh, we've got Mary B who's joined us, but we've Fantastic. also got um mark cass cass who has uh joined us he's a newcomer he says wow Fantastic. first awesome. time i've caught you guys live merry christmas everyone so welcome mark it's nice to have you here and a merry christmas to you and yours fantastic thank you so much it's great that you have joined us hope you enjoy uh, the podcast and the team awesome all right now, as we've discussed, this now puts the spotlight firmly on Scott Tadich because he worked at an aluminum foundry, right? So, Neverly, are you able to read the very first slide for our podcast? But that was an amazing yeah, sure. introduction that, that blew my mind. That's something I, that was new to me. And I hope you guys found that very interesting. All right, so if we can have uh, Jack61, our very first slide, uh, which is part uh, slide number 23. Yeah, give me just one so second, now, guys, and I'll have it yeah. up. Yeah, no hassles. So now uh, we now discovered that the Avery salvage yard contains an aluminum smelter. They checked the smelter, and there was no evidence that the smelter was used or even turned on, right? And in last week's episode, I showed you pictures of the aluminum smelter, of the wood uh, furnace. There was no evidence of any cremains there. So the interesting thing is now, the only other aluminum smelter that we know about is the one at the foundry. And Scott Tadich is now the brother-in-law of Stephen Avery. Uh, and guys, I don't have to tell you, but does Scott Tadich like Stephen? Yes or no? Oh God! Are they good he friends? Does Are they not. good? Ah, there's a weird hatred going on there. Yeah, there's a war. There's a war going on. Um, uh, Susan, any other comments? No. Um, uh, regarding that, I just want to say our link to our merch site is broken. And um, okay. I can't, I can't fix it right now, but we will as soon as we can. Fantastic. Sorry. Let's hope we sold out. Let's hope we've sold yep. out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So, Neverly, would you like to now continue? This is the, what we're going to do is we're going to finish the chapter, but the focus now is on Scott Tadich. Now, please, before you start, Neverly, we are not accusing Scott Tadich of any wrongdoing here right guys right right correct we're not accusing scott of any wrongdoing but we're reading no. out the chapter right guys rhonda did you yeah. have a yeah mm -hmm. okay oh, no I was anthony fields has a question thank you rhonda just rhonda uh what's the question 
Anthony Hill says Scott Tadich. No, no, no. What Scott Scott Tadich's alibi on the fourth? Do we know? Uh, that I don't know. That that I don't know. But this, don't worry. Hey, this is going to get very interesting. Okay, Neverly, would would you like to uh, start our reading? Yes, boss. Yes. <laughs> yes Here we go. Boss. <laughs> Here we go. When Scott Tadich was 29, he was hauled into the Manitoba County Jail on charges of battery, disorderly conduct, and criminal damage to property. And it would not be the only time he would end up in one of those local jails for criminal acts of violent tendencies. According to the criminal complaint, officers in nearby Two Rivers met with a woman on July 7, 1997, at her residence. Quote, she had an altercation with her living boyfriend, Scott Tadich. She stated Scott had accused her of seeing another male, and she told him to leave the residence. Scott began packing up some clothing and personal items. At one point, she walked past Scott, and he was swinging at the back of her head with his left hand, but he missed her. She told Scott that uh, she told Scott that was the last straw, and she went uh, into the TV room to get his duffel bag and take it to the kitchen. At that point, Scott went out of control and picked up the water cooler and slammed it down, hitting the kitchen chair and the microwave cart. She then called her mom and dad to come over because she feared for her life and her son. Scott kept making comments to her, and he pushed her two times, end of quote. Tadich decided to take out his anger and rage upon the woman's laundry. Quote, Scott went downstairs and threw all her laundry, clean and dirty, all over the basement floor and in the drain. Scott also punched her in the chest with his right fist. Scott walked back up the stairs and the victim was going to follow when Scott locked the basement door. When she opened the door, Scott punched her again. Scott's mother and father had arrived, and both she and his mother had seen Scott strike her. Scott tried to push her down the basement stairs and shut the door. End of oh, quote. God. When Tadich went into the garage, a fight erupted with, uh, over the fishing rods. Quote, she was going to take the rods away from Scott, and he slapped her on the right arm. Scott filled up his car with his items and told his mom to get his brother, end of quote. As tensions escalated, Tadich drilled his girlfriend's son, who was only a boy. Quote, Scott punched him in the upper left chest with his right fist. The boy fell to the floor and was crying. Her son is 11 years old. More chaos ensued. Scott went outside and ripped the CB out of her truck. She went into her truck to check for damage, and Scott was screaming at her, and he pulled her hair. After Scott pulled out of the radio, her radio, clock, blinkers, and backup lights would not work. At no time did she give anyone permission to damage her property. The victim's 11-year-old son gave this account to Two Rivers Police. Quote, he saw Scott pushing his mom. Scott went downstairs to get some clothes, and Scott began to throw clothes all over, and Scott tried to rip up the victim's sweatshirts. The boy stated he was fearful Scott would hurt his mom. Scott began screaming at him and calling him a lard ass and a fat ass, end of quote. Things got nasty when the child tried to stop Tadich from harming his mother. Quote, Scott went back upstairs and was pushing his mom around inside the kitchen. He stepped between the two and Scott knocked him to the ground. He fell to the floor and he was crying because it hurt. End of quote. Under a plea bargain, Scott Tadich was found guilty of criminal battery. On October 13, 1998, he was ordered to stay in the local jail for 135 days, which is now, a little bit over six months. Yeah, does anyone have any comments so far? 
he's got a freaking temper and who punches a 11 year old boy yeah somebody's that's, son that's not... not your own son somebody else's son yeah, he, mother. He, he, well i mean one. yeah clearly he's um He's got a he's he's hot headed and uh, loses control. He lost control. He he really lost control. You know when you uh, it, it's one thing to get in a fight with you know uh, your brother or you know maybe even a friend or whatever, but when you smack a child like that, uh, you've really lost all control. And uh, to me that that goes into red red zone red red line and um, got a problem there. Yeah. Yeah, he. It seems to me that he can. Scott can go into an uncontrollable rage, uh, and uh, can be quite explosive, uh, and has got no no qualms in hitting a kid, that and that's and also hitting a woman as well. Uh, that that's actually quite sad, you know. Just just my say, just an opinion. Uh, anybody else got any comments? Yes, there's a question question in the chat from Gazwal. He or she said, I wonder if the other competing salvage yard had a smelter. <laughs> That's a very good question. Very good and question. I would say that if if it's a commercial salvage yard, most of them would have a smelter uh, because what they do is they uh, melt down various metals like uh, aluminium uh, and recover it and sell it. Uh, and that way there are merchants that purchase the um, various metals that they smelt from vehicles and they get money that way. So I would dare say that yes, other commercial salvage yards uh, would have an onboard um, smelter. And as you can see, the al aluminum smelter in Stephen Avery's uh, or the Avery salvage yard wasn't that massive. It doesn't have to be. Um, so it wouldn't have taken very much to set up. Yeah, very good question. Thank you. Um, any other comments, guys, or we continue our reading? All right. Uh, Neverly, would you like to continue our yes. reading? Seven years later, at the time of Teresa's disappearance, Tadich worked an overnight shift at the aluminum foundry near Manitowoc's downtown. All of a sudden, the sticky key letter arrived in Green Bay suggesting Teresa's body was incinerated. Was the Wisconsin Aluminum Foundry plant in Manitowoc Central to the missing photographer's dismemberment? Was Sikiki an illiterate worker's best attempt at trying to identify Tadic by his nickname of Skinny at the foundry? As of 2006, plant foreman Keith Schaefer had known Tadic for nine years. Quote, Keith went on to say that he had been hearing Scott Tadich telling some of the workers in the plant about information of the Teresa Halbach murder homicide investigation. Keith had heard that Scott had not shown up for work on October 31st, 2005. However, he had heard he went to see his mother in the hospital. Scott had been telling people he had seen the fire on Halloween by Stephen Avery and Scott on the other uh, or the other people made it sound like he had gotten out of the vehicle and actually talked to Stephen by the fire. Keith also heard from the other guys that Scott had noticed stains on the pants and shirt of one of Barbara's kids. And uh, just before, yeah, just before you go, Neverly, um, Scott wasn't at work on October the thirty first, and that was allegedly confirmed by Lisa Novacek. So she confirmed that Scott was not at work on that night. Uh, does anyone have any comments? Uh, Jack 61. Well, you, you know, there's two reports, November 10th and November 29th, and they differ on that accounting because in one port, uh, report, he, he says he wasn't. He was at the hospital with his mom. The other report, he says he was, comes home, changes clothes, goes hunting, and, and all the other. So... Yeah, that's good that we got a confirmation from Miss Lisa Novacek. Yeah, Lisa Novacek confirmed that uh, Scott allegedly, because remember, he actually said that um, him and Barbara, Bob had gone over to visit him that night and stayed all night. So that means that Scott couldn't have gone to work. He had stayed with Bob on the evening of October the 31st. So he didn't go to work, right? So that confirms what Lisa Novacek said. 
interesting. Uh, Nevely. Sure. As many people may remember, the prosecution maintained that infamous bleed to blue jeans belonged to Avery's mentally disabled nephew, Brandon. Attorney Zellner strongly suspects that any cryptic conversations were not in regard to Avery's slow nephew. Rather, any phone calls made to Tadic at the Wisconsin Aluminum Foundry concerned Barb's other son, Bobby. After all, Brandon, 16, and Scott Tadic had nothing in common and had no real relationship whatsoever. On the other hand, Bobby and Tadic were tight. And both of them uh, were hunters. Both uh, of them were hunters. Right. Yeah. And remember, remember Jack 61 on October 31st uh, at around 3 p.m., both of them gave a mutual alibi of having seen each other uh, and which ca cannot be corroborated. Jack 61. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And uh, obviously, we've, we've discussed it uh, at length. I, I have real problems with that uh, that statement. And, and you know, uh, again, this is just from what I've read. I'm sure others have read, too. Um, there were issues, and I can't remember which boy said it. I don't know if it was Brad or it was one of them that said it, that basically he said that Scott didn't really like any of the kids being, you know, part of the he, – he just – they didn't really get along. He didn't really get along with any of the other boys at all. Um, at least, correct. At least early on, I, I, you know. Obviously, times have changed. It's a different time now. I'm talking about snapshots in time in 2005. So let's. let's I just want to be clear yes. about that. And correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but Bob was formerly married to Scott Tadich's cousin. Yes. Yes. <laughs> correct. Hey, and right. the, uh, Bob. And is it Tom Yanda? Yes. So that they were going for divorce at that stage. Yeah. And Scott and, you know, Scott and, and, and Barb, you know, began seeing each other at some point. Uh, it's really unclear when. I, I don't guess it really matters. And then um, Yanda moved out. I think it was October 10th. I think that's the day, 2005. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And uh, guess guess who was on the Avery Salvage Yard on November the 4th when the flyover happened? Tom Yonder. Tom Yonder, yeah, that's right. And and Tom Yonder stated that he saw Bobby Dassey and Mike Osmondson. Yeah, that's right. On the, on the property. So November the 4th, guys, seems to be a very interesting date because <laughs> that's what the yeah. Sakiki note is referring to. And Evelyn. Yeah. And although we don't know exactly when Barb and Scott Tadish started dating, we do know that the kids did not care for Scott from the get-go yeah. because the mother, their mother, Barb, was seeing him before Tom Yanda moved out. Uh, and yeah. they officially uh, That's divorced. my understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that is my understanding. Correct. Well, and, yeah, that, uh, that wouldn't be, I mean, you know, that. that I think that's normal feelings for you know kids, especially yeah. you know at a young age. Of and course, they're protected. Could, yeah, their mom and dad and their family. Yeah. Well, I mean, short of you know uh, the husband being really super abusive and wanting him the hell out, you know, and the 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 new guy coming in and being a protector. Uh, so yeah, I think that's kind of normal. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, yes. just to refresh my memory because as we know there's so many players in this case did Ta uh, does Scott Tadich have any kids of his own I don't think so but I could be wrong I don't think so either I know and he's got I, a, I know too. I know he's got a brother but I, I don't think he has children from a prior relationship but I could be wrong about that yep yep that I don't know so that he's now know. dating a woman who has four teenage boys. So that's a handful. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Neverly, continue. We're almost finished. Hey, hey. After Teresa went missing, quote, Keith described Scott as being extra edgy lately, a short-tempered, angry person. Keith said he's a chronic liar, and does not really get along with a lot of people at a plant, 
and would never know when he would blow up at somebody. I, Keith felt Scott also knew more about the murder than he had told people. And Keith felt Scott could be very capable of the murder or knowing something more. End of quote. Interesting. 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 This is not a good thing that, for somebody to say about you. No, no, it's not. Yeah. Yet, all the while, Tadic's romantic relationship with Barb remained fine. However, because of the case, he did seem disturbed by what was going on, Schaefer said. After Stephen was arrested, Scott had thought um, it had been a setup and that he was being framed. However, a week later, Scott did not believe this anymore and thought Stephen was guilty. Wow. End of quote. Oh, a... So what changed? What happened? Yep. That's for correct. For him to change his mind and to be so vocal and so angry about it. Correct. Correct. So Scott had initially thought that uh, Stephen was being set up, uh, but then thought, no, nah, Stephen is guilty, which is yeah. rather remarkable. And of course, um, Scott Tadic um, is a very important witness for the state. Because, first of all, he gave an alibi to Bobby Dassey, who was also a very important star witness for the state. And Scott Tadic had mentioned a great big whopping fire, right? That's exactly what was needed. If you're going to cremate someone, you need a great big whopping fire. You need a lot of fuel and a lot of time. So it's interesting that uh, Scott Tadic uh, then flipped and said, nah, it's not a setup. Stephen Avery is guilty. Now, for those who have been following along in the chapter, we've actually finished the chapter, believe hey, it or not. Hey. We've actually finished the chapter. But for those who'd like to do further reading and research, uh, John Farrakh has got the references that he uses in his chapter right over here. And the majority of those you can find in our Foul Play library. Now, before we continue, and I know people have got questions, I want to ask a very controversial question. I'll go around the panel and in chat. Do you honestly believe, especially what we've talked about today, do you honestly believe Scott Tadich had anything to do with the murder of Teresa Hallbach? Yes or no? Alice. Oh, we may, we may. Alice. I am. Um, don't know. Okay. Okay. Uh, I don't recall. I don't think so. Definitely had a hand in covering it up, but I don't think he, I don't think he killed her personally. Okay. Interesting. Uh, Susan. I would say possibly. Okay. Oh, you broke. You're breaking up a little bit, Susan. So you're fifty-fifty. I think we lost her. You're gonna have to reconnect, Susan. You're you're. Yeah, your lights on, but nothing's coming up. Okay. What about you? What What about you, Jack Sixty One? Do you think Scott Tadish had anything to do with the murder of Teresa Horbach? No, I, I don't. I don't think he uh, killed her. I don't think he had anything to do with that. I do think that uh, he cooperated um, under duress for the state. Okay, interesting. Interesting. Uh, just Rhonda, what do you think? I actually have the exact same opinion as Jack. I don't think he's involved in the murder, but I think he, um, I don't know why I'm losing my voice, but I think he uh, definitely had uh, cooperated with law enforcement and the state uh, under pressure for whatever reasons. Yep. Very, very interesting. Thank you very much, Just Rhonda. What about you, Neverly? Yes or no? I don't think that he had anything to do with killing Teresa, but I, oh my God, I hate to even say it, but I do believe that he had something to do with a cleanup or tying off that problem, 
you know. Mm -hmm. And he definitely cooperated and got a deal with law enforcement because, as we know, his um, criminal record got expunged or disappeared, and also he was in debt. So that was that disappeared, and he got a nice house, you know, 5.1 acres on the yep. riverfront. So I don't know. Yeah. Uh, for and, me he lied, and he lied, and he lied, <laughs> he lied, yes. and he com Likely. he was compromised with the alibi, you know, with Bobby. But we still do not know what did they do together or separately after they saw, quote unquote, each other at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me personally, I don't think he murdered Teresa Horbach, uh, but I do believe he was a very compromised witness. Mm -hmm. uh, and he basically he basically agreed with everything law enforcement said to him, and he definitely assisted law enforcement to point a finger at Stephen Avery. Uh, I'm now blown away by this uh, Joe Mott connection and to San and Sandra Morris. Uh, this throws a whole new light on everything. But the scary thing is, it's pointing a finger at the Avery salvage yard as being the potential site of the murder, right? And that's scary. It's not pointing outside the salvage yard. It's pointing to the salvage yard. But quite clearly, and Jack61 put up the pictures, they checked the smelter. They checked the um, wood, wood furnace. They found no evidence of anyone... Uh, a, being used, and B, anyone being cremated in it. But, lo and behold, what do we get? We get human cremains found in Stephen Avery's burn pit. I'm sure they didn't know about Yonder Burn Barrel Number 2 until later, and they certainly didn't know about the Manitowoc County Gravel Pit. So, could have that seeded an idea for, the, for law enforcement to say, uh-huh, we've got all these tips. Why don't we just put the cremains in the burn pit instead of the smelter, which is going to be much, much harder to do, right? Put them out in the open, right? Because we know that on November the 6th, right, guys, when Trooper Re right, Jack 61, when Trooper Reese took that picture and you showed it of a bear uh, standing near the burn pit, yep. there was no bone pile anywhere there was no crime scene tape this is november the 6th there was no crime scene tape no one had smelt anything no one had seen a pile of bones nothing and the investigators were definitely around that area and trooper reese took in situ pictures of the burn pit he had no idea of the role so guys can you now see the importance of what we just went through in this chapter, right? We we talked about the Sakiki note, and boom, out pops Sandra Morris and Joe Mott. That's you, crazy. You think about right? that, that that photo of Bear, you know, and, and you read any number of uh, the reports of these guys that walked up on that scene of the fire, uh, this little fire burn area, it don't match it at all. It, nothing. They just made it, They just made shit up. Correct. Correct. And John Earl has got a lot to answer for here, guys. He really does. Because John Earl is the one allegedly that sifted the cremains and disappeared. As soon as it got dark, everyone disappeared. Roy right, Neverly. Oh right, my Texas God. 61. Don't get me right. started on that one. Yes. Well, start of, whereas Sturt event too, Doc. Sturt event, Sturt event. Yes, Joe as well. And like, I think it was Sturdivant. Was it Sturdivant the one that said, it's my fault, my fault, my fault, my fault? Yeah, he fell on his sword. Sipple was there. He fell on his sword. Sipple was there. Yep. So he's another one. Correct. So look at this, guys. Look at this. At Cuss Road, where nothing took pl allegedly took place, they're there all day. And they're bringing tower lights. They've got a helicopter flying around, taking aerial pictures and... They've got the guy with the 3D measurements, right? Remember the guy on the he was on the boom. He's taking 3D coordinates with the t with the total control system. 
Yep. Now, allegedly nothing happened, but we've got pictures of a tarp and tower lights at night time. And yet the sight of cremation of your victim, Teresa Horbach, they all piss off when it got dark and they all ran away. They put no tower lights there and they didn't stay there all night. They didn't tape her off. And they didn't come back until uh, the day after. No, I mean, not the following day, but the day after that. They just left it there. We bobcats. Yeah. No coroner. No coroner. No, no forensic. Bed, no nothing. Yeah. And wait for it. The most smartest woman that Ken Kratz has ever known never was on the Avery Savage side. Oh. This is the <laughs> state Forensic, don't laugh, Nephilim. It's true. Sorry. The state forensic (laughs) anthropologist was asked, Well, were you there? No. Did you check this out? No. How'd you get all your information from the investigators? (laughs) From the (laughs) investigators. Anyway, right? So to me, it's truly remarkable how we've gone full circle on the Sakiki note. And uh, Avery Wave, I reckon, was right on the money that the Sakiki note was likely written either by Sandra Morris, <laughs> Joe Mott, or Dvorak herself, just to stir shit up, right? Just to stir shit up. This is a really interesting connection, uh, finding out that Mott's... Uh... Sandra Morris's brother, uh, really interesting. It's just a, another little uh, family connection there that uh, I really didn't know at all. Right, and you, you could damn betcha, this is bizarre. Joe Mott, they routinely go to the salvage yard, correct? Yeah. They said it. Yep. And yet, and yet, his sister had a gun pulled on her. By Stephen Avery. I couldn't find that in your Apple Music Library. Oh you God! Can ask me to play radio station or ask for your music in a different uh, app. Uh oh, Siri, Siri went crazy on you. You're blurred out, doc. Uh oh, we may have lost Doc for a minute till he gets his. Thing straight down. Under control. Yeah. The smartest woman. Yeah. Siri. <laughs> so, you're you're giggling and then go got me started. I was laughing in the background. Hey, Alice, you, you, Alice, did you have something? Yeah, yeah. Um, as soon as I went on camera, um, Mark Cass and chat um, knows myself. <laughs> he says, "Hi, Alice." I know you're from Scotland and you should have your own podcast, Foul Language. <laughs> I have Foul also... language, that's funny. Yeah, uh, I also uh, have also seen the Luke Mitchell case and it's shocking. Yes, it absolutely is. Um, maybe sometime I'll make a, a Alice in Wrongful Conviction Land and Foul Language, maybe, and the, the, the title for the podcast. <laughs> So we have foreplay and foul language going on. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think, uh, you know, sometime early in the new year, we should, you know, re go through murder in a small town and talk about it again. And then, you know, catch everyone up, especially the new ones that are new play- people that have come along and are unfamiliar and don't know. Uh, yeah. The, yeah, that would be awesome, Jack. Um, not only that, there's new information that's came out in the, the case in that as well. Uh, the police have been hiding evidence. Um, the so-called missing knives are only missing in the first place because the police have had them. The the so-called essay that wasn't written is written and there's two copies of it. So, yeah, um, it might be a, a, a good idea. I'm going to hopefully try and do... Um, a lot more videos um, next year, um, just as we're waiting for uh, things to happen, because I know Luke's team are going for an appeal, um, appealing again. So, uh, but yeah, that would be fantastic if we could uh, go back and have a wee revisit in a 
Um, an update, really, yeah. Absolutely. Hey, Doc, you're back. I got hi- I got hijacked by Siri. I saw that. I was like, <laughs> what the hell? I said it again. <laughs> Don't say that. I got hijacked. <laughs> Yeah, your your screen went. Uh, it went uh, had a fog over it, and then we got the voices right. like, "What the hell, man? He got took he got uh, Skylab took out. over." I yeah, Skylab. Take, I got taken yeah. out by Siri. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, look, guys, um, it, this has been truly a remarkable episode, and uh, again, I like to thank Avery Waver. And please, guys, in chat. You know, you guys come up with some good ideas or suggestions when you look at our podcast. Write them down. We it goes to prove we a we don't know everything, but b we'll check. Right, Jack sixty one. If we can, absolutely. We'll, if we can, we'll go back to our original documents. We'll dig out the good stuff, and we put it together. And so Neville and I were able to simply modify our podcast and added the extra bits. Yeah, and I believe that it really enriched the podcast rather than just reading uh, the remaining chapter. It really had a great discussion, and now you can see it in your mind. Oh my God, the uh, connection of Sandy Morris, Joe Mont, the depositions, the yeah. smelters, all in one melting pot. Unreal melting pot. No in the melting, in yeah. the I definitely well, think there was a, a, a bigger discussion going on, or at least another discussion going on, that we really have uh, just a very small idea of that they were going to help get Avery or something. Whether it had an effect or not, I, I think that uh, this anonymous call by female to uh, um, Hamrel, Hamrel is Hamrel, yeah, you Hamrel. know, Correct. yeah. Yeah, something. I, I wish we could get our hands on it, but who knows? Maybe someday we will. Cor- correct. Wouldn't it be funny if it was Ju- Judy Dvorak's voice? <laughs> <laughs> well, wow. it was a bit of... correct. Correct. But well, you know, it's that's not how... that out there. It's not that outrageous because that's how rumors start, right? All right. Well, look, guys. Again, thank you so much, and. uh I and everybody on the Foul Play team would like to wish all of you guys a, a lovely Christmas when it hits uh, December the 25th. Um, soon I'll be going for a barbecue, <laughs> barbecue lunch, which is great. But let's go uh, quickly around the panel. Uh, tell us how you're coming along. And uh, yeah, let's start off with Alice. Doc, um, it's uh, actually the 25th of Christmas Day here. Uh, now, so um, I'll be going to bed. I've got my son and my daughter-in-law coming over tomorrow. So yes, yeah, so I've got my 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 dancing Santa. <laughs> so fantastic, fantastic. He tries Loki nuts. Loki doesn't like it. Um, he tr- he tries to hit it. When it's on because I put it on the floor and it starts dancing and he tries to hit it. He does not like it at all. So, <laughs> so all right. I'll be a lovely day with my son and my daughter. Fantastic! But yeah, but you have to say it's all you have to say it's all bollocks with your Santa hat on. Oh, it's all a load of bollocks. <laughs> Thank and you so all much, bunch of fannies. For the ones that like me saying fannies, it's all a, they're all a bunch of fannies. <laughs> correct, 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 correct. Thank you so much, Alice. Fantastic. Thanks, Thank you. Uh, next we have I Don't Recall. I wanted to add um, that must be the p- police or the Manitowoc the investigators did not like their help, whoever did the sicky letter, because they tried to hide it, or uh, I don't know no if they hid it, didn't bring it no, up. No, you no, know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> so, must be they didn't like it. Either that, or they knew who wrote it. Either that, oh, or they knew who point. wrote the sicky note, or had their suspicions. Yep. <laughs> Interesting. Thank you, I don't recall. And next we have Susan. Can you hear me? 
Yes, a little bit crackly. Ah, uh, okay. Not sure what's going on. Um, yeah, it's very, very interesting. Uh, gives you a lot to think about. Um, yeah, sure does. It's amazing how new stuff comes up in this case after all this time. It's just uh, mind-boggling, really. But uh, I tried to say earlier that I thought maybe Scott Taddock was involved if he was maybe friends with Kasurik or um, Sandra Morris or, you know, or the Correct. killer, whoever that is. Correct. Anyway. I hope everybody has a wonderful Christmas. Ours has been delayed because of the deep freeze in this area. But um, it's still a special day, no matter what. So Merry Christmas, everyone. Thank you very much, Susan. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And next we have Jack61. Yeah, I'd like to uh, first thank uh, Susan for that wonderful song earlier that we, we started off with. That was great. I really, I really enjoyed that. And I... You're right. I had listened to it, but it's been a while. Uh, number two, we need to get Zoe to sing for us again. Uh, I think yes, everybody would appreciate that. Um, you know, uh, this this uh, comment from Avery Wave, uh, there's another topic, and I'm not going to get into it. That's on Reddit that um, I've debated, you know, with them um, over something. And, you know, this idea of critical thinking, and this is exactly what this was, it's a it's critical thinking and bringing in another element that they knew about that we didn't. So then that brings together, you know, a whole new thing of, of potentially a thinking of how things, how something happened. And we need this so desperately in the community. And, and this is, a, you know, it's, I don't like accusing people, especially of something serious. You know, if I accuse somebody of jaywalking, who cares? But no, this is something pretty serious. And so, you know, we we are forced to speculate. Anyway, just wanted to thank them for continuing to be part of the community that, that's uh, really studying what we have, document-wise. So please, guys, continue to do so. Let us know. And if there's something that we can dig out and find, we will. Uh, number three, I do want to report, uh, for those that don't know, uh, this goes back again to my open uh, records request from August 25th, 2022, and some really uh, it, real issues with that request and the response that I'm getting from from Queso. Uh, this last letter, I had, I got a um, a couple of things, but I got a couple of things denied. Uh, one of them is a interview that Brendan gave. It's on cassette, and uh, Uyghur's telling me that the crime lab is not converting cassettes right now, which is just mind-blowing to me. It's mind-boggling. He also, as many know, I requested hundreds of phone calls that Jody made while she was incarcerated. And what I got were Stephen phone calls. Not one of them was, from, was made by Jody. Not one. So they've taken Stephen's calls, labeled them as Jody, and said it's good. It's complete bullshit. Yes, there's, it is. There's some other things that are, that are in that. Um, that I mean, they're important, but they're they're. I'm, I'm not even going to worry about them right now. One of them is uh, there's 206 photos that Officer Block from the Manitowoc City Police took that was denied because he says the CD is degraded and they they the, uh. it won't, they won't open. But he doesn't care. He, you know, he could go to the prosecutor and say, hey, "Look, I need a fresh copy of that." The prosecutor's got a copy of that CD, and they could make a fresh copy and put it with the evidence. And you know, it, it would not break the chain of custody. It's been in the prosecutor, and he makes no effort to do that whatsoever. So we got more no. fucking evidence of this case just just degrading, and he doesn't give a shit. No. And no. so anyway. I said all that because there are people out there that can sometimes help with open records requests. And I have talked to, I'm actually in contact with someone that hopefully can help uh, getting some of this shit because there's absolutely no reason that we, we're not getting the, the Brendan interview that we've never heard. This was on March 1st. It's on cassette, not on videotape. 
This is a cassette recording of an interview that we've never heard before. Uh, and the actual Jody phone calls that I, I know exist. Anyway, just want to report that. Wish everyone here I'll play a wonderful Christmas. Everybody in the live chat and listening. A Merry Christmas as well from the Jack family. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jack61. And uh, again, I just want to say uh, a, a truly astounding amount of work that uh, you did uh, and your and uh, the other members putting the open mics together. It's really been uh, very illuminating and very important too. <laughs> There's so many, so much stuff happening. It's just amazing. And the Netflix versus Colburn suit, civil suit or lawsuit is so important for many, many reasons. Yeah, we'll probably, I mean, unless something crops up, um, you know, this coming week, probably a one night this week, we're probably going to dive back into the depositions. I'm not going to do an open mic tomorrow, this Christmas day for us. Yeah. So we'll wait till one day next week and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll put something on. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jack61. Uh, next, we have uh, Just Rhonda. Thank you, Doc. Um, I just wanted to pretty much just say Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to all of my uh, family members on the panel. Um, to me, um, the members of Foul Play, the staff and mod, you guys are my family. You're like you're just like my family. You're my brothers and sisters, and um, and I. I, I don't have the words to express my gratitude for all of the, um, everything that you've done for me this this year personally and uh, for all of the patience that you've shown me and love and kindness and I just wanted every all of you to know that and uh, for for those in chat those that you are here uh, every week or every every time we do a, a podcast and you're here and some of you don't want us to ever leave. <laughs> But uh, we're all so, I'm so grateful to you as well. And I just want to uh, say, if I may quickly, um, how grateful I am to, I started doing um, my own podcast again this past weekend, or this past week rather on Thursday. And uh, I've been away for a little while, so I hadn't done anything. Uh, but I did, um, I did come back Thursday and I didn't particularly cover the, the Daniel's case, but I did. Uh, I did ask some of my panel members and friends to join me on my panel to discuss some um, significant cases and trials that they may have watched or that we may have watched throughout this this year. Because 2022 was crazy in crime. So, um, so I, I was very honored to have Dr. Silkman. Uh, join on the panel. It was amazing. And I had Alice and Jack and Susan and Cherie were there. And um, I was so grateful to have Neverly. Neverly, Neverly <laughs> snuck in. <laughs> yeah. Neverly snuck in for a while. She was still at work, uh, but she was able to get and find the time to actually chat with us. And we had a really good conversation. And um, so we're going to do it again next next Thursday. Um, we're going to do the same thing. We're just going to pick up where we left off. We're going to do like a part two. And so because um, there were so many things that we didn't get to discuss. And we went for what, you guys, almost four hours. And uh, that was a record for me. My Shocker. Channel, it, was a, it was shocking. But it didn't <laughs> feel to me. It didn't feel you're, like uh, it You're giving there with uh, open mic uh, there. I just yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I don't know what the longest op, op, open mic is, but I think I might have Except I think about I, six I, hours. I think just oh, I think, okay. I, think well, I think it was I think it was five hours and forty seven minutes. Okay, oh, no, I I didn't get that close, but but anyway, it was a great discussion, and really we only touched on a few cases. Um, I took most of the time talking about the Daryl Brooks trial, uh, and so. Um, but, you know, I had others, you know, were making comments about different cases. So anyway, we're going to do it again on Thursday. And so I invite all of you back again 
to join again if you're able to and uh, and bring your bring the cases that you want to talk about. Um, and it was really great. And it was so great to see new people in my chat that have never been in my chat before. Um, for instance, Barb was there and I was so surprised and shocked. And I really thought that was really nice of her to be there. And there were several others that I hadn't seen in my chat before um, from Foul Play. Uh, Behind the Magic was there. And um, I can't remember, Case 10 was there and so that well lots of lots of people i don't want to start naming because i'll forget somebody but for those of you who were there for the first time at one of my in one of my chats i really really appreciated you being there but don't go anywhere because we're going to do the same thing next week and uh and we had a blast it was so much fun it was a really good time we had a really good time and really great discussions so yeah, I appreciate you uh, for being there too, Jack, and and for um, you know for all of you for adding your comments and and whatnot. So um, next week Thursday at five p.m. Central Time, we're going to do it again. And sorry, I kind of hijacked that for my own purposes, but it's no, Christmas, no so <laughs> correct, correct. So, and thank I you just want to say, yeah, I just want to say, just Rhonda, you've done an incredible amount of work uh, for the um, Daniel Holtzall case and other cases as well. And uh, it's rather remarkable that you can come back together, do a podcast, and it can go for yeah. four or five hours and everyone's having yeah. a good time and a chat. And um, that's a credit to you. It really is. No, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Merry Christmas Fantastic and Happy job. New Year. Thank you. And also to you, just Rhonda, and your family. And finally, we've got uh, Neverly. How things coming along with you? Hello, everybody. Yeah, things are going well. I truly am thankful to see, you know, over 40 people, like 44, 45 people in the chat, you know, plus uh, two, four, six, eight, nine people on the panel. That's a lot of people, you know, for Christmas Eve. So I'm thankful for that, grateful. So I hope everybody, whatever holiday you are celebrating, we say Christmas, but whatever you're celebrating, uh, may you have a wonderful time, if nothing else, just some a few, you know, days off. That would all, all that always feels good to take a breather, right? So right. the topics that we are discussing is, of course, very infuriating, like the whole case. And as Ali said, maybe we should, you know, do the murder in a small town, maybe we can start watching Ma'am again from the beginning, because guess what, you guys? I'm sure all of us have seen it multiple times. I must have seen it 20 times. I can recite it backwards. But there's always something that you pick up. And yes. that's what I love about it. And you can fast forward through, you know, things that you don't want to see and whatnot. So it's amazing. Just like this is, this um, Joe Mott is an example of how we should step back and go back to the beginning. And not only that we're uh, going to the beginning of the Teresa disappearance case, but we're going back to 1985. That was how many, almost what, 40 years ago? It's a long I can't time. compute that in my head. A long, long time. And look what we've discovered. And just one more thing, and then I'm going to totally let go and go to my Christmas party and have a good time. When it comes to Scott Tadich and his involvement in this whole uh, case with Teresa, we know that we, most of us actually in the chat and on the panel felt that he was at least compromised. And we're wondering what are his connections to the law enforcement because it's not like he was squeaky clean. He had a, definitely a rap sheet, you know, with violence, domestic abuse and whatnot. He punched the freaking kid, the 11-year-old kid. Somebody else is cute. God. Anyways, um, just one thing that boggles my mind is that the prosecution called him, not Barbara, but they called him the stepfather of Brandon so they could have him talk to Barb, you know, and think about the plea deal. 
remember the 15 yeah. years? That's so, why I say that's why I say he was compromised. That, that's what makes me think totally, that. Totally. Totally. And you know the his connection with Jerome Fox, the judge who was yeah. Brandon's judge, who was hard on Brandon. So they're calling him. To me, that's unbelievable. He's not his biological father. It's a new relationship. And they're call they feel comfortable calling Scott Tadich to work on his wife for Brandon to take a plea. I'm just dumbfounded by that. And to me, it tells so much about the relationships that are going in that small town. And yes. in this case with this family. And the, and oh. the power and the power of yes. law enforcement. Yes. The intimidating yes. intimidating power of law enforcement. Yes. Correct. Yes. So Correct. Mm -hmm. all right. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neverly. Well, um, I think Neverly and I are gonna take a couple of weeks off before we do the next reading with the crew. Is that right, Neverly? Yes. We've got a few things going on. So, we'll so probably next take... Saturday is New Year's Eve and globally yeah. people celebrate that. So we feel yeah. like it shouldn't be fair to take you away from the celebrations. We also no. need to clear out our heads, but I don't know if we're going to uh, continue on the week after or two weeks after that, because we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. But definitely not next week because it's New Year's. Yeah. It's we'll 31st, yeah. Yeah, yeah we'll see and we'll be, keep you posted. That wouldn't be a good idea for next week, Doc. I mean, I'm bad enough normal, but can you imagine me with a drink in me? That's no. just, that would not yeah. be a happy <laughs> show. <laughs> Maybe we should, actually, Alice. No, foul play would be kicked off YouTube. Right, right, Alice? <laughs> There'll be no more foul play. No, no, you probably wouldn't be dark, no. <laughs> great, great. Well, look, guys, just in closing, again, it's been a terrific year, hardworking year, a lot of challenges for a lot of people, uh, you know, life happens and things like that. But uh, just in closing, uh, I'd like to thank every one of my team members, uh, the Foul Play team, and as just Rhonda said, we are part of a family, which is we're going to look back this five or 10 years time and go, wow, we actually did all of this. Phenomenal. We don't even know each other. Most of us don't know each other or from all over the world, but we formed this great bond, which is remarkable, you know, and uh, we all got our different talents, our different skills. We put them all together. That's our play, uh, which is remarkable. And uh, I'd just like to say, please support Jeff Jones' channel. Uh, like I said, Jack61, myself, uh, Kelly, uh, Big Jeff, and Jeff, we do a series of podcasts looking at MAM2, and that's always controversial and really good fun. Uh, check out Becca Chu, who does a lot of uh, work regarding Brendan Dassey. Uh, also, check out the um, the latest podcast between Mark Hodenot and Paul Capaldi. I think it went for about an hour or so, but it really... It hits you here. It really hits you here. It You now understand why you're involved in this case. Because Mark talks directly to Steve. Goes and visits Steve in prison. And, you know, for someone, for him to be so supportful and he appreciates all of our support, that's that makes it really worthwhile. You know, so please check, check that out. And, uh, guys... I like to say we will catch you all very, very soon, and a big Merry Christmas. <laughs> Hold on, <laughs> let me get my uh, my side companion over here. Uh, he uh, your he, emotional he, support. He's my emotional support, and uh, guys, we'll catch you all very soon. Take care. Take care, everybody. Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, stay safe. Merry Christmas, Merry all. Christmas. And this has been a Foul Play production.